The first Bravely Default game came out for the Nintendo 3DS in 2012, which, first off, damn. Second, I was a huge fan of it. It was a callback to the kind of JRPG that I grew up loving, and it did it so well. Bravely Second was a direct sequel to that game, and that one was good, it was fine. I liked it, but not as much as the first one. Bravely Default 2 is a standalone entry into the series. You don't need to play the others before you play this one, which is great because you should play this one. Bravely Default is a series from Square Enix as an intentional throwback to Final Fantasy games from the 16-bit era. Turn-based battles, party of four, collecting four treasures of the elements, etc, etc. The most clear comparison here would be Final Fantasy V. Again, this is intentional, so I say all those things with praise. It's great to have a series that is committed to the kinds of RPGs that I love, only with gameplay that I consider to be much, much better. If you've played any RPG game before, you'll be in familiar territory here. Battles are turn-based, you select a command, and see it execute. Its main unique mechanic is after its own namesake, the Brave and Default system. Characters can default, or defend, which also nets them an additional Brave point. On any turn, you can expend Brave points to do multiple actions with that character. This causes a risk-reward system, and makes it so that even when a character blocks, they get some kind of benefit out of it. Additionally, you can brave up to have a total of four actions in a single turn, but also do it at a brave deficit, a risky play for major payoffs, but end up doing nothing while you recharge. Even more interesting, some additional skills, attacks, or abilities can only be used by expending brave points, making defaulting to save up for those attacks have great payoff. It's a surprisingly intricate system causing a lot of decision-making in the middle of combat, especially against bosses that are tough to beat. And conversely, max breathing on turn one to slap a weak enemy with your sword four times to end the battle quickly is a great way to speed things up. Unlike previous Bravely Default games, every character has a time gauge letting you know when their turn is up next, instead of the previous pick the whole team's command and watch it play out. This adds another layer of strategy, as you need to plan ahead for character speed and some commands can manipulate time gauges, such as slowing down an enemy's turn or delaying your own. As a player, this also means less downtime between control. That kind of decision making is what makes RPGs so fun for me. There's merit to blocking, to going all out, and to being careful and reactive. And enemies can also brave and default, causing some dread as you watch one default up to max and you know you need to prepare. Combat decisions are furthered by enemy weaknesses. Of course, the typical elemental stuff, plants are weak to fire, use light magic on ghosts, the usual. Enemies also have weaknesses to weapon types, which means it's good to have a variety of weapons available on your party and to switch them on the fly when it's needed. What all of this does is that not a single battle is mindless. You know the old criticism of RPGs where you just rapidly press the confirm button to fight to kill everything and move on as quickly as possible? You can't do that here every single battle will require at least some analysis. Now this could also be seen as a complaint because even battles against weak enemies aren't super quick, even with the battle speed sped up. The battle system is overly familiar and doesn't do anything too incredibly innovative or mind-blowing. It's very competent at what it is, which is very good and very fun. Just as good as the previous games is also the job system. As before, every character can have a main job and a sub job, unlocking new passive abilities, extra combat actions, and some mastery abilities. There isn't really much to say about the jobs here. They're all pretty much refined versions of jobs we've seen dozens of times before in the past. Warrior, Black Mage, White Mage, Archer, Thief, Monk, so on. Again, these are probably the best versions of them so far, but don't expect anything too out of the ordinary here. New changes in attributes are the weight capacity and chance to target stats. Different classes are allowed to equip so much total weight of weapons and armor. Naturally, a warrior type can equip more heavy armor and weapons versus a thief who can barely hold two daggers at once. Now first, this may seem frustrating because you can't just equip every single best piece of equipment you have. However, I love it. I think the weight system is excellent. This new limitation breeds creativity, as you'd have to choose what you are willing to sacrifice to get the loadout that you want. You want to hold a bigger weapon? 
Are you willing to downgrade armor or lose the shield for that? This also means that whenever you arrive at a new town, you can't just buy whatever thing your party member needs that has the highest numbers. You have to pick and choose what works best for your team and your strategies. Shops are no longer about just buying the most expensive thing and going through the upgrade motions. There's some real thought process that goes into every single item slot. In addition to the weight, items also have a chance to target stat. It's exactly what it sounds like. The higher your chance to target stat, the more likely you will be attacked. Naturally, this is offset by the heavy armor jobs having higher chance to target stats. But even something like a white mage has pause, upgrading to a new healing staff when you see that it nearly doubles how often the squishy mage would get hit. This all culminates into interesting decision making in equipment, buying, jobs, abilities, loadouts, and a customization. It's an additional layer of optimization that I love. The best in slot is no longer so clear cut. Just trying to put on a new big ass sword has just as much interesting decisions as you would in combat. That's great. Though, like the battles not being so mindless, some people may prefer simplicity and will hate the weight system. I think it's great. It also makes leveling up way more rewarding because your weight capacity increases and now you can equip even cooler stuff. I like that I can make as much intricate decision making in items as I do when initiating combat. Plot wise, Bravely Default 2 is painfully familiar. As I said earlier, it's dozens of hours of get the four crystals of the elements while bad guys go after them kind of plot. Like other Bravely Default games, there's more to it than that, but for the most part, the banality is painful. While it's better paced than the rest of the series, the first chapter alone takes quite some time to get through and can feel like a bit of a drudge. The main cast is surprisingly likable. Seth and Gloria are basically better versions of Tiz and Agnes, while Elvis and Adele are likable in their own right, but they're hardly replacements for Ringabel and Adia. The antagonists can be about as one note and cartoonish as you expect, but I will say there is a lot more depth to them and even some surprisingly dark themes than previous. All of this is with voice acting that is generally pretty good. And before you go off complaining about Elvis's bad Scottish accent, he is literally voiced by an actual Scotsman. He sounds fine, and he's cool. One of the best quality of life upgrades is that, generally speaking, the game is not grindy. Yes, you can, especially for those who obsessively max out every job and every character before moving on even though it's completely unnecessary, Lady Pelvic. In general, it's not as much as it was before. This is also sped up with special items that allows for multiple battles in a row and a job point bonus. There's also a voyaging ship that goes out and finds treasures for you while the switch is in sleep mode. This typically results in items that instantly gives experience points and job points, meaning you can get some quick grinding in even while you are asleep. Another great upgrade is that random battles are now visible on the overworld, meaning you can attempt to avoid or outrun them. Even better, you can attack them or sneak up from behind for an initiative bonus going into that combat. You can also cut grass to find free items and money, and this is addicting. Equally addicting is the entire game as a whole. There is a ton of stuff to do. Aside from the aforementioned max out every job and every character thing, there are lots of side quests to find and complete. These range from collecting so many monster drops, finding a specific monster, and some arduous irritating ones of run back and forth several times to play messenger between two NPCs. A few of these side quests also have cutscenes that provide additional backstory and character development for both the cast and some of the villains that you faced. It's a nice touch to further reward those who explore every nook and cranny day and night. Plus, you can even find some optional jobs this way. There's also rare monsters that you can find, which are very difficult but provide fantastic item drops and rewards. It's fun to hunt these down and attempt them, even if they'll immediately kill your ass. Speaking of, I've been playing this entire game on hard mode. It is indeed hard. If you're an RPG veteran in need of a challenge, hard mode will kick your ass but not be impossible and it's wonderful. And if all of that is not enough extra stuff for you to do, there's a card game. A really good card game at that. It's entirely optional and doesn't have a ton of different cards to acquire, but it's very good and fun to play just on its own. Quite frankly, it's better than Triple Triad. Also worth noting, there's a few user interface issues, such as selecting a command in combat, selecting an enemy, backing out to choose a different command, and then your cursor moves off the enemy. Or when you're scrolling through a huge list of items, there is no quick scroll of any kind. You gotta do it one by one. Bravely Default 2 is good. It's so good. I like it more than Bravely Default 1. It hits that exact right spot of RPG for me. I'm a sucker for any game, 
with a job system. I like the new equipment customization, and all the battles are intricate enough that it was keeping my brain active. All that said, there really isn't anything stellar or incredible about it. Bravely Default 2 earns an 8 out of 10. It's the perfect example of a very, very good RPG that isn't quite amazing. Like if I did decimals at all, I would easily give this an 8.9 out of 10. But I don't do that, and no, I won't round up. Bravely Default 2 is the best 8 out of 10 RPG that I have ever played. And it's an easy recommendation from me to anyone looking for a new RPG to play, Nintendo Switch owners or otherwise.